Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Page seven. I go for refuge unto and enlighten him to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, by my tribulation of Christ, of healing, and so forth, and become a Buddha to guide the law of sentient beings. I go for refuge unto and enlighten to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, by my tribulation of Christ, of healing, and so forth, and become a Buddha to guide the law of sentient beings. I go for refuge unto and enlighten to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, by my tribulation of Christ, of healing, and so forth, Sangyo all phenomena arising causes, the causes are caused by the Dharma, the sensation of causes is caused by grace here. that you might have to try to think about emptiness as you recite it. Tiyata gate gate paragate parasambhade bodhisvaham Go, go, go beyond, go still beyond and, and establish enlightenment. So as you say this, go, go, how to go? From where to go? And from where to go? And the place where to go? From, from where to go is who you are now are very stressful, painful, and say, um, very tiring, and very sad, miserable state, sickness, aging, death, and so forth. From there, we go towards perfect happiness. <coughs> perfect happiness. Um, your mind is forever, forever fresh with luminosity, with kindness, and uh, stress-free where no external factors can affect you, you're forever, you're forever, 24-7, you are at peace, you are happy. So this is the way you went, this is known as the full enlightened state. And how to go? Go in, 
five phases, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangade, Bodhiswara. And how to go from first Gate to second Gate to third? By what? There should be the, the force, energy to go, and the direction to go. Energy to go and the direction to go. If you have the direction but you don't have the energy, you cannot get anywhere. If you have the energy, if you don't have the direction, you may take the U-turn. So therefore, making sure that the energy is there and the direction is there, both are required. So the energy is given by the spirit of the Bodhicitta, unconditional love for all other dear mothers and beings. And even this practice, this sentiment, love and affection to us also beings, this must be cultivated. Without cultivating it separately, we can't expect that to come automatically. So, um, so this is known as the practice of bodhicitta. This must be cultivated separately. And if we really want to be happy, as what we have been discussing the last many days, that one, be kind to yourself. Always be kind to yourself. One. Number two, be wisely kind to yourself. Number two. Be kind to yourself and be wisely kind to yourself. Okay, so with this, with this, if you are ready to be kind to yourself, what should I do? I should give myself the maximum happiness. This is how you kind to yourself. Now, how wisely to be kind to yourself? Engage in the action. Om ye dharma hetu prabhava. All phenomena arise from the respective causes. If you want to give the maximum happiness to, you, to yourself, you must look for the causes for the maximum happiness. You must give the causes for the maximum happiness uh, to yourself, to give this to you. Then, what is the cause of the maximum happiness? One factor is this energy of the bodhicitta, the unconditional love for others. If you could really cultivate this, there's a tremendous joy coming in you, tremendous self-confidence there. In fact, in this universe, the most beautiful mind that can possibly exist in this universe is the bodhicitta. It is unconditional of others. This is the most beautiful mind. Most beautiful mind. This is unconditional of others, the bodhicitta. And then along with this, we need the direction. The direction where to go. The direction where to go. This is the direction given by the wisdom of emptiness. And the wisdom of emptiness, this is the most fearless mind. The mind. If there is one mind which is most fearless, in this universe it is the wisdom of emptiness. You have this wisdom of emptiness, all your fears will drop. This is this is that thing, one thing that we need to keep in mind. So om dhyatha om gate gate paragate parasamgate bodhi soha. So how do you go like this? But in order for in order for you to provide the maximum happiness towards yourself by being to be conscious of yourself in the most wise way is by looking for this energy of the unconditional love and the direction of the wisdom of emptiness. Energy of the unconditional love, which is the most beautiful mind, the mere presence of that within you makes you the happiest person, very joyful person. And in this direction given by the wisdom of emptiness, the mere presence of that within you gives you such a confidence and fearlessness. All fears will drop. So, what more do you want than these two things in your mind? So this is what we should be expecting from this. As we recite this, don't just recite it blindly. Don't just recite it without knowing the meaning. We should know the meaning and we should know how to go. Go, go. How to go. Go through the energy. Go with the help of energy with the help of direction. Direction with some emptiness. And imagine that the Buddha Shakyamuni are very the most compassionate teacher of Buddha Shakyamuni, he is exhorting thus <coughs> that don't remain in the fears of samsara. Come, come towards the ultimate state of happiness. Come towards the ultimate state of happiness. And you hearing this melodious voice of the Buddha Shakyamuni, then we inspire your two grandparents, your children, and all your family members, all such beings. Come. Let us see what this our very compassionate teacher Buddha Shakyamuni is, is exhorting us, exhorting that. We should not remain in samsara. Yes, of course. Let us not stay in samsara anymore. Let us not stay in this fear of samsara anymore. Let us go away. Let, let us rise above this samsara. Let us go towards enlightenment, towards the state of ultimate happiness where the misery is unheard of. Okay, with this in mind, 
imagine that you are leading this and all sentient beings are joining you, including your two parents, children, and everyone. And Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and all the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, they are just watching you, so passionately watching that you are doing something so great today. And this is the best way by which you can repay the kindness of your parents. Give, um, make a gift, the greatest gift to your children and to, all, to everyone in the universe. Okay, with that in mind, let's recite this. <coughs> This is the full form of the title. In praise of Buddha Shakyamuni, in praise of Buddha Shakyamuni for his having taught independent origination. Okay. So um, yesterday we were talking about the emptiness on the one hand and dependent origination on the other hand. Emptiness and dependent origination. And uh, we also come to know that say like the two sides of the same coin, like two sides of the same coin. On one side is emptiness, and on the other side is dependent origin. This is so important. It's so important. Many people, without knowing this, many people, they they can they can confuse. They can confuse emptiness, and they don't think that they, they, they are unaware of their own confusion. They think that, oh, emptiness is nothing. In Buddhism, there's, there's nothing. In Buddhism, there's no self. In Buddhism, there's no karma. Is what many of the people, even the, some of the professors, professors who teach Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, even they say like this. This is very unfortunate. So we have to keep in mind that emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means independent origination. Emptiness and dependent origination 
these are the two sides of the same coin. Let me reiterate what we did yesterday. So the five points. Five points, the five fingers. Same, emptiness. How do we know that emptiness and dependent origination, these two are the two sides of the same coin? First, emptiness. Emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness is a short form of, number two, emptiness of independent existence, number two. Emptiness of independent existence means there is no independent existence, number three. There is no independent existence means all existences are by dependence, number four. All existences are by dependence means or everything is dependently originated. So from these, this the line of with these with this line of the defined points, we see that emptiness means dependent origination. Now dependent origination means the middle way. How dependent origination means the middle way? Dependent origination has two sides. What are they? Dependence and origination. So first side, first part, dependence. When you say dependence, what is the opposite of dependence? Independence. So when you say dependence, it rejects independence. By dependence, it rejects independence. Independence and absolutism, these two mean the same. So by the first part, dependence, it rejects the extreme of absolutism. Now what is the second part? Origination. Origination means something comes into origination. Something comes into existence. What is the opposite of existence? Non-existence. Non-existence and nihilism mean the same. So the second part, origination, it rejects the extreme of nihilism. So by dependence, it rejects the extreme of absolutism. Origination, it rejects the extreme of nihilism. Combining the together, dependent and origination, it becomes dependent origination. Combining them together, the two extremes are rejected. Rejecting the two extremes is the middle way. So therefore, emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means dependent origination, and dependent origination means middle way. So therefore, emptiness means the middle way. So this is what we need to keep in mind. So with this in mind, uh, let's turn to page 11. No, page 54, sense 11. For you, when one sees emptiness in terms of the meaning of dependent origination, then being devoid of intrinsic existence and possessing valid functions do not contradict. So, uh, what it says that for you, you meaning you, the Buddha Shakyamuni, with the Buddha Shakyamuni, when one sees emptiness, emptiness not seen as nihilism, but seen as dependent origination. When one sees emptiness in terms of the meaning of dependent origination, then emptiness, empty of, empty of intrinsic existence, empty of independent existence. And on the other, other hand, we have the dependent origination. With the dependent origination, then the functionalities are there. Emptiness, the functionalities are still there because of dependent origination. By depend, dependent origination means by dependence on good things, good causes, good results come to being. By dependence on bad causes, bad results come to being. So cause effect relationship, law of karma, these all can be accounted for while you, while you advocate the concept of emptiness. There's no contradiction. For you, when one sees emptiness in terms of the meaning of dependent origination, then being devoid of intrinsic existence, while you accept devoid or the emptiness of intrinsic existence, you can also possess, you can also explain, account for the possession of valid functions, valid functions, functionalities can be accepted. That emptiness of intrinsic existence and the functionalities, they do not contradict. So this is, this will come to you only if you can understand emptiness in the context of dependent origination, not emptiness in the context of nihilism. Twelve. Whereas when one sees the opposite, okay, opposite meaning, emptiness means nothingness. If you understand the emptiness to be to mean nothingness, then whereas when one sees the opposite, since there can be no function in emptiness, then if the emptiness means nothingness, in nothingness there is no function you cannot account for functionality. So emptiness, then functionality can, cannot be accounted for. Since there can be no function in emptiness, no emptiness in what has function. Those which has function cannot be empty of, cannot be nihilism, cannot be nihilist. One falls into the dreadful abyss you maintain. So if you understand emptiness in the context of nothingness, then you will fall into 
nihilism. You will fall into dreadful abyss of the nihilism. Whereas the proper understanding is, you have to understand emptiness not as nothingness but as <coughs> dependent origination, right? Then, what is the benefit? While you adhere to emptiness, you can also account for the functionality. There is no contradiction. If you don't see the contradiction, what is the benefit? By seeing emptiness, there is one benefit. By seeing the functionality, there is benefit. By seeing emptiness, all your negative emotions will dissolve. Fear, anxiety, attachment, depression, stress, they will all dissolve because they are all they are all they all grow out of self-grasping ignorance. So seeing the emptiness, which says that everything is empty of objective existence. Self-grasping ignorance says opposite. Everything exists objectively. Self-grasping ignorance says that. So with understanding of emptiness, then self-grasping ignorance will be proved as wrong. Self-grasping ignorance will disappear. When the self-grasping ignorance disappears, then the ground for all the miseries is gone. When the ground is gone, all the miseries <coughs> dissolve. Right? So by seeing emptiness, all miseries will dissolve. Then on the other hand, emptiness means what? Dependent origination. By seeing dependent origination, then you will, in, you will see the infallibility of law of karma. Infallibility of law of karma. The cause-effect relationship. Say, by dependence on the causes, all results will come into being. By dependence on good causes, good results will come into being. By dependence on the practice of both chitta and wisdom emptiness, then gade gade can happen. Right? By dependence, by dependence on not practicing the wisdom emptiness of both chitta, then no gade gade will originate. Right? So that way we see that functionalities can so well be accepted and all the virtues, compassion, by seeing, by dependence on being kind towards others, your happiness will grow. But by dependence on the practice of compassion, compassion and the bodhicitta, then you, your Buddha nature will be unraveled fully. That will originate. Right? So it says that 12. Okay, whereas when one sees the opposite, since there can be no function in emptiness, no emptiness in what has function, one falls into a judgmental abyss you maintain. Therefore, in your teaching, seeing dependent origination is hailed. Seeing dependent origination is praised. Is praised. That too, not as an utter non-existence, nor as an intrinsic existence. Okay, look. Now, dependent origination is what? Middle way or nihilism? Middle, Middle way. Because it is middle way, it should be freed of the two extremes, right? Okay, so now third line says that too, not as an utter non-existence. What is utter non-existence? Nihilism. So seeing dependent origination, the utter non-existence should be avoided. Then, nor as an intrinsic existence. Intrinsic existence means? Absolutism. Independent existence. So by dependent, seeing dependent origination, then the extreme of intrinsic existence or absolutism will be rejected. Fourteen. The non-contingent is like a sky flower. Hence, there is nothing that is not dependent. Okay. Contingency. Contingent. Contingent, dependent is to be the same. Say, if things are not, not dependent, then things should be independent. Independent is non-contingent. If things are non-contingent, if things are independent, then things should become like a sky flower. Why sky flower? Why sky flower? Why sky flower? Okay. Say, the flower which we see like this, the flower which we see like this, this flower should necessarily, in any way, this is a plastic flower. Okay. The real flowers, the real flowers, they should necessarily grow by dependence on other causes and conditions. Right? Whereas, if, if flowers can be without dependence, Flowers can come into being independent of any other causes, while another flower can come in the air and sus remain suspended like this. So if there's if there's non-contingency, if there's independence, then you don't you do not depend on causes and conditions. If you don't depend on causes and conditions, still you can have something, then why not you have a flower in the sky? The non-contingent is like a sky flower. Hence there's nothing. So since the sky flower is not not existent. So the sky flower is not at all existent. So therefore, what does it imply? It implies that there is nothing that is not dependent. Everything should be dependent. One, 
if things exist through the essence, through, through the essence or through intrinsic nature, the dependence on cause and conditions for existence is a contradiction. If things do exist intrinsically, essence meaning intrinsically, if things do exist intrinsically, then things have the power on their own. If the things have the power on their own, why should they, they depend on others? Why should they depend on others? So depending on causes and conditions cannot be accountable if things have essence or things have intrinsic objective existence. 15. Therefore, since no phenomena exists other than, other than origination through dependence, no phenomena exists other than being devoid of intrinsic existence. You talk. Okay. Um, Okay, so this this stanza, stanza 15 is by the author. Who's the author? Who's the author? Who's the author of this text? Lama Tsunkhaba. Okay, now if you turn to page 217. If you turn to page 217. So what is said there in page of the page 55, stanza 15, which we read, which we are reading, and page 217, the last line, since there is no phenomenon that is not dependently originated, therefore there is no phenomenon that is not empty. So this stanza is by Aranigarjuna. So what is said by Aranigarjuna and what is said by Lama Tsunkhapa, the, the author here, these two are very similar because, because they got the the ultimate experience. Mm -hmm. On the ultimate experience, they come to the same experience. Ultimate experience. So let's see whether these two are similar. Stanza 15, page 55. Therefore, since no phenomena exists other than origination through dependence, meaning everything should exist by dependence, there's no phenomena which does not exist without dependence. Therefore, no phenomena exists other than being devoid of intrin intrinsic existence, meaning Every phenomenon exists by dependent origination. Every phenomenon is every phenomenon is empty of intrinsic existence, right? So now, Arunigarjuna, what he said is that since there is no phenomenon that is not dependent originated, therefore there is no phenomenon that is not empty. This stanza is one of the the favorite stanzas of His Holiness the Dalai Lama when he was giving teachings to the public, and he oftentimes encouraged people to memorize these stanzas and. Use them in your daily practice. Okay, stanza 16. Page 35, stanza 16. Because intrinsic nature cannot be negated if phenomena possess some intrinsic nature. Okay, what it says here, and this is again very important. If things do exist independently, if things do exist intrinsically, if things do exist intrinsically, then, then you cannot reject intrinsic existence. Then, then you cannot ex reject independent existence. Okay. If phenomena possess some in because intrinsic nature cannot be negated if phenomena possess some intrinsic nature. Then if things do exist independently, then you cannot negate the independent existence. If you cannot negate independent existence, then um, who are we? Who are we? We are enlightened beings or unenlightened beings? Unenlightened beings expecting to be enlightened through gade gade. <coughs> right? Okay, now, if this is who we are, we are unenlightened beings. Unenlightened beings, and we as unenlightened beings, if we exist independently, nobody can change us. If, if, we, if nobody can change you, then say if you're independently existent, if you, if you exist intrinsically or independently, then you do, you, because you exist independently, you don't depend on causes and conditions. So causes and conditions cannot change you. If the causes and conditions cannot change you, what you are will remain forever like this. And there's no hope for gati gati. <laughs> right? So therefore, there's no hope for nirvana. There's no hope for enlightenment. So it says that, OK, uh, because, stanza 16, because intrinsic nature cannot be negated, if phenomena possess some intrinsic nature, intrinsic nature means independent nature then nirvana would become impossible. For us to achieve nirvana, for us to follow this gade gade and achieve enlightenment is impossible. And elaborations could not be seized, you talk. Elaborations here, if you could remember what we did in the early classes, say, say this flower, 
How elaborate is this flower? Very elaborate. With the, say, the petals, beautiful petals, and the colors, and the leaves, and the, the, the small, small bushes here and there. There's so many diversity there. It's so elaborate. And yet, if you, when you subject this, when you subject this to ultimate analysis, okay, those of you who are coming for the, the first time, so you may, uh, may feel that this is little, but uh, it's what? <laughs> okay, this is something which I did not hear before. But never mind. So, say, if you subject this to the ultimate analysis, this diversity, this elaborations, what happened to elaborations? <coughs> will disappear. You will see the emptiness of the flower. So the elaborations disappear. So whereas, if the flower does exist independently, if the flower does exist independently, then when you subject this to ultimate analysis, will this disappear? It will not disappear. The elaborations will not disappear. Okay. And the elaborations could not be seized. Could not be seized, could not be, could not disappear. You taught. You taught you who? You, Buddhist Akimani. 17. Therefore, who could challenge you? So with this, this concept of the emptiness of objective existence and dependent origination, with these two concepts, therefore, who could challenge you? You who proclaim with lion's roar in the assembly of the learned ones repeatedly that everything is utterly free of intrinsic nature. So the Buddha, so pre-Buddha era, pre-Buddha era, no one was there to teach about emptiness. Everybody believed. What is the opposite of emptiness? What is the opposite of emptiness? What is the opposite of emptiness? Independent existence, intrinsic existence. So before Buddha, pre-Buddha era, people all believed in intrinsic existence. That things exist, the stuff exists intrinsically. Everything exists intrinsically. This was the belief. Okay, now, yet, this Prince Siddharth, after six years of going into solitude, into austerity, into practice, then he became fully enlightened. He discovered this secret, this ultimate secret of the, the universe, that things are all empty of intrinsic reality. Things are all dreamlike. And he was surrounded by everyone saying that things are all intrinsically real. Things are all independently real. And yet, without any fear, he taught that how everything is dreamlike, how everything is empty of objective existence. So with great confidence, he taught that, right? Which means, which means that, which means what? If he is surrounded by people who believe in objective existence, and he is saying that there is no objective existence with such a fearlessness, and no one can challenge him. Which means, which is reality? Dreamlike nature, the empty of objective existence, or the objective existence? Empty of objective existence, okay. So, so now, today, we see that, say, with the advent of quantum physics, relativity theory, then we see that, that even the physics is turning towards what the Buddha said, that objectively, there is no intrinsic reality. In the absence of the observer, observed make no sense. And the principle of uncertainty, has in works, principle of uncertainty. All these, they, they point towards what is taught by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. Okay. Uh, 18. Well, let me say 17 once more. Therefore, who will challenge you? You who proclaim with lion's roar. Lion's roar meaning lion is the king of the wild animals. Lion is the king of the wild animals. When he starts roaring, so all the animals will be in, in what? Will just subside, right? Likewise, when the, the Buddha taught this with the lion's roar, the, the metaphor of the lion's roar, that everything is empty of objective, it's nobody could challenge him. Okay. 18. That there's no intrinsic existence at all, and that all functions as this arising, this arising, and depends on that. What need is there to say that these two converge without conflict? Now what these two? One is the emptiness of intrinsic existence, and then on the other hand, dependent arising. But it depends on the causes, the results arise. That there's no intrinsic existence at all. This is emptiness of intrinsic existence. And on the other hand, that all functions as this arising and depends on that. That the functionality is accountable. 
that the functionality is there, where by dependence on the causes, the results arise, the results come to being. So this is the functionality. On the other hand is the emptiness of intrinsicality. So these two, what need is there to say that these two converge without conflict. Instead of, in fact, instead of seeing the, say, discrepancy between the two, these two converge, these two go in parallel, these two complement each other rather than conflicting. 19. It is through the reason of dependent origination that one does not lean towards an extreme. Okay, so uh, what we said earlier was that emptiness does not mean nothingness, it means dependent origination. And dependent origination means the middle way. So therefore emptiness means the middle way. So if it is middle way, it cannot be nihilism. 19. It is through the reason of dependent origination that one does not lean towards an extreme. Extreme of nihilism and extreme of absolutism. Why? Because emptiness is not seen as nihilism, it is seen as dependent origination. Dependent origination has two sides, dependence and origination. Dependence rejects the extreme of absolutism, and origination rejects the extreme of nihilism. So combined together, rejects the two extremes. Rejecting the two extremes is following the middle way. So therefore emptiness is middle way, and emptiness does not incline towards any of the two extremes, because emptiness is seen in the light of dependent origination. It is through the reason of dependent origination that one does not lean towards an extreme. That you have declared this excellently is the reason, savior of your being an unexcelled speaker. So the Buddha, you are revered an unexcelled speaker because you talk emptiness in such a way that that anyone who anyone who proclaims emptiness is not tilted towards any of the extremes, could follow the dependent origination, could follow the middle way so precisely. 20. All of this is devoid of essence, essence meaning all of this is devoid of independent existence. And from this arises that effect, these two certainties complement each other with no contradiction at all. Meaning, all this is devoid of essence, emptiness. One. On the other hand, from this arises that effect, dependent origination. From by dependence on this, then the result arises. The result is originated. So one hand is emptiness, on the other hand is dependent origination. So these two concepts, because of the understanding of emptiness, all your negative emotions dissolve. Because of understanding dependent origination, also all your positive qualities arise. And these two understandings, these two understand the certainties, certainties meaning your discernment, your conviction that things are 100% empty of objective existence. On the other hand, things function infallibly. So these two certainties, these two certainties complement each other with no contradiction at all. 21. What is more amazing than this? What is more marvelous than this? If one praises you in this manner, this is real praise, otherwise not. If you really understand emptiness and dependent origination, on that basis, your negative emotions dissolve, your happiness grows. If that happens, then when you praise the Buddha, you will never praise the Buddha. Oh Buddha, you, you, you're amazing, you're great, you're great teacher because you flew. <laughs> this is what you will never say. You will say that because you taught emptiness in the context of dependent origination. Okay. 22. Being enslaved by ignorance, those who fiercely oppose you, what is so astonishing about their being unable to bear the sound of a low intensity. Okay, 22-23. So let me give you a little uh, feedback here, quick background here. So, say, um, say the when the Buddhist Shakyamuni, our compassion teacher was giving teaching, say, general, overall speaking or generally speaking, we can think about the the people who are around the Buddhist Shakyamuni may not be following the Buddhist Shakyamuni, who are around the Buddhist Shakyamuni. We can group them into two: one who followed him and others who reject him, right? Who followed other teachers who would say that things are objectively real. Okay, so they, those, of, those who said that things are objectively real, things are objectively real, that would be okay. This Prince Siddharth, who became the, who is respected or who is, uh, who is proclaimed to be enlightened Buddha, I do believe in him. I believe in mine. So that person, 
can you expect the person to to see things as to to have this wisdom to see things as empty of objective existence? No. So the author is saying that that's understandable. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it because the person in the first place. Right from the beginning, the person says that what the Buddha taught, I don't believe in it. I don't take it. <coughs> so he left. That's fine. But amongst the, the people who appreciate the Buddha, who revere the Buddha, amongst them, the author sees that there are two groups. One, both, both accepts dependent origination. Both, accepts, both accept dependent origination. And then one group, not group this, right? Group A and group B. <laughs> group A, by hearing the Buddha Shakyamuni teaching dependent origination, since our revered teacher, the fully awakened one, taught dependent origination, dependent origination means things should exist. If things should exist, things should exist objectively. One group. Another group is that because our revered teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, taught that things are dependent originated, there should be no independent existence. Dependent originated means independence is rejected. There should be no independent existence. Without independent existence, how can there be intrinsic existence? So they reject intrinsic existence. There are two groups, right? So the author, Lama Tsumaba, says that this group, group A, who says that our teacher taught dependent origin, therefore the, our teacher is teaching that things, are, things exist independently, things exist objectively. This is really amazing. <laughs> Right? Okay. Okay, 22. 22 is pertaining to the, pertaining to the, the, the non-followers of the Buddha Shakyamuni. Being enslaved by ignorance, those who fiercely oppose you, they oppose you. What is so astonishing, what is so astonishing about they being unable to bear the sound of no intrinsic existence, the sound of emptiness of intrinsic existence. Even if they cannot bear it, it's fine. But, 23. But having accepted dependent origination as your teaching, that the precious treasure of your speech, your speech, who your Purushakam's speech, then not tolerating the roar of emptiness. This I find amazing indeed. Okay, 24. The door that leads to no intrinsic existence. So finally, the only if we see the emptiness, only if we see the emptiness of objective existence, then we can wake up from the sleep of ignorance. Only if you wake up from this, the sleep of the, the, the dream ghost chasing you, only if you wake up from the sleep of dream ghost chasing you, then you will have a you will have a permanent relief from the dream of the, the, from the the what, ghost dream. Only if you wake up, right? You have to wake up. Likewise, only if you wake up from the sleep of ignorance, then you have a permanent freedom from samsara. Of the ignorance, right? Okay. So, therefore, we have to wake up. Wake up means we have to see what what we dreamt is all empty. What we dreamt is all what we dreamt is all not real. This we have to discover. What we dreamt is empty of reality, emptiness of objective existence. This we have to realize. So, to realize this emptiness of objective existence, to realize the emptiness of objective existence. Right? The best way by which to go there is the understanding of dependent origination. So dependent origination is the, the main entrance through which we can get to the which can get to the paradise of emptiness, wisdom of emptiness. 24. The door that leads to no intrinsic existence. The, the, the door that leads to the emptiness of intrinsic mm -hmm. existence. This unexcel door of dependent origination, through its name alone one grasp that intrinsic existence. Now, so what is the door to emptiness? Dependent origination, concept dependent. And you accept dependent origination and you go, you take a U-turn. <laughs> you accept dependent origination and instead of going towards emptiness, you take a U-turn towards non-emptiness, towards dependent, independent existence. The door that leads to no intrinsic existence, this unexcelled door for dependent origination, through his name alone, you, if one grasp at intrinsic existence, if you grasp at objective existence, independent existence, now this person who lacks the unraveled entrance, that the person doesn't have any entrance. The only entrance that you have, you to the you turn. So you cannot go to the to the, the treasure of the Vishnu emptiness. The who lacks the unraveled entrance, well traveled by the noble ones. So this entrance, the wisdom of the dependent origination, 
Then this entrance taking you towards taking you towards ultimate reality, emptiness. This is how all the noble beings traveled, all the past Buddhas traveled. This is how all the past Buddhas traveled. Well traveled by the noble ones, noble ones referring to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. By what means should one guide him to the excellent path that pleases you, the Buddha? Right? Okay. 26. Intrinsic nature. Now, in what way? Dependent origination and intrinsic existence. These two are opposites. In what way? Intrinsic nature means uncreated and non-contingent, non-dependent. Whereas dependent origination is contingent and dependent and created. How can these two converge? On the one hand, you accept dependent origination. On the other hand, you accept objective existence, the, uh, the second class of the, the followers of the Buddha. So these two are just contradictory because intrinsic nature means it's uncreated and non-contingent. Whereas dependent origination means contingent and created. How can these two converge upon a single basis without contradiction? Whereas you are accepting it, so this is a contradiction within you. This is what the author is as uh, starting to the, the, the second class. 27. Therefore, whatever origin is dependently, though primordially free of intrinsic existence, appears as if. Now, okay. So you have, uh, we have been learning about there's no objective existence, there's no objective existence, there's no objective existence for the last how many days? <laughs> how many years? There's no objective existence, there's no objective, all, everything subjective, subjective. How many years we have been studying for the last? How many years? Three, 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 four days, right? <laughs> okay, four days. Okay, so with this, after learning all these things, after learning all these things, then you see, actually, these are major atoms. Yes, where is the flower? The flower disappears, right? Then from the object, where is the flower? It's empty. And from distance, you can see the flower, which is just objective perception. From the object, it's just atoms. Even the atoms will also disappear, right? So with this analysis, you know that. You know it. Now my question to you, look at it. Look at this flower. How does it appear to you? From the object or from your mind as a projector and making it, how does it appear to you? from the object. So since it, the reality, and how it appears is contradictory. The reality is that it is empty from the, the object existence. It is empty from the object. Right? The reality, when you go towards the object, you see the atoms. And none of the atoms is a beautiful flower. None of the atoms is beautiful. And the flower is so beautiful. So there is, when you go towards the, on the object level, you may end up seeing the atoms. And the atoms will also disappear. Let's say the atoms. And none of the atoms are beautiful. None of the atoms are beautiful, 100%. <laughs> none of the atoms are beautiful. But if you look at it, you see a very beautiful flower. Where is this beautiful flower? It's not from the object, it's coming from the mind. You know that. When you know that, when you look at it, how does it appear? Again, it appears as from the object. So since there's a discrepancy between the two, how it appears? as so objectively, and the reality coming from the subject, empty from the object, there's a discrepancy between the appearance and the reality. So why do we call something as an illusion? Why do we call something as an illusion? When you look at the when it, mirage, mirage is a good example of illusion. Why do we call mirage as an illusion? Because it appears as water, and the reality it is empty water. Because there's a discrepancy between the appearance and reality, we call it as illusion. So likewise, everything that we see around, everything that we see around, right? They all appear in one way, they exist in another way, right? Okay, the person who's sitting next to you. Okay, look at the other person sitting next to you. Look at it quickly. <laughs> huh? Oh, good, 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 good. I did not ask you to smile. No, no, I asked you to look at the other person. No, I did not ask you to smile, seriously. Okay, now, imagine that you are seeing the same person to whom you smile. Imagine the same person you, to whom you smile. Imagine the same person on the atomic level. On the atomic level, 
on the atomic level, would you smile? <laughs> if you smile, you have to go to mental hospital. <laughs> if you see the atoms and you start smiling, <laughs> you have to go to mental hospital. <laughs> then TPC is in problem. <laughs> right? When you see the atoms, then do not smile. Whereas, the fact that you're smiling means you're not seeing the atom, you're seeing something else. Right? So what is that something else? It's not from the atoms. It's from your mind perceiving it. And yet, your mind created you smiling again. Right? Actually, it is true. So therefore, look at it. You smile at it. If you know that it's your mind creating it, you will not smile at it. If you know that your mind is creating it, you will not smile at it. The fact that you're smiling at it means it appears from the object. Right? And the reality is that it's coming from the subject. It's empty from the object. Yet you see it as said coming from the object. Appearance-wise, object. Reality-wise, empty of objectivity. You are seeing it? There's a discrepancy. So therefore, just as the illusion is perhaps it's illusion, because of the discrepancy between the appearance and the reality, everything else is also illusion-like because there's a discrepancy between the appearance and the reality. Okay. Okay, uh, 27. Therefore, whatever origin is dependently, though primordially free of intrinsic existence, the reality, number two, uh, line two, the reality is that things are all primordially meaning since, since time immemorial, since within this time, things are free of intrinsic existence. Things are empty of intrinsic existence. This is reality. Appearance-wise, appears as if it does possess intrinsic existence. Appearance, there's objective existence there. Reality, empty of objective existence, empty of intrinsic existence. So, you, the Buddha, taught that all this is illusion lie. You're getting it? Okay. 28. Through this very fact, I understand well the statement that in what we have taught, those opponents who challenge you cannot find faults that are caught with the reason. Even however many people come to challenge you, the Buddha, Buddha, they may challenge you, but they don't have any sound reason to challenge you. 29. Why is this so? Because by declaring these, by declaring these, what? Declaring the emptiness of object existence, and by declaring, by declaring the dependent origination, the chances for reification and denigration towards things seen and unseen are made most remote. Seen meaning the manifest phenomena, seen is the manifest phenomena, and the unseen meaning the non-manifest or the hidden phenomena. Okay. And the chances for reification and denigration towards things seen and unseen. Chances for reification. Reification is absolutism. Reification. 29, line 2. Chances for reification is what? Absolutism. Denigration is nihilism. So, when you, because by declaring these, declaring the, declaring the, <coughs> declaring the compatibility, declaring the compatibility, complementarity of the emptiness and dependent origination, then the chances of the two extremes is distant. The chances for reification and denigration towards things seen and unseen are made most remote. Why? Because when you see emptiness in the light of dependent origination, then by dependence it rejects absolutism, it rejects reification. It rejects reification. By origination, it rejects extreme of nihilism, it, it rejects denigration. Denigration meaning that you deny the existence of Existence of things. You say that nothing exists. And reification means that you exaggerate that things don't exist objectively and you exaggerate that things exist objectively. So exaggeration and denigration both are um, the major motion mode. 30. Through this very part of dependent origination, the rationale of your speech being peerless, convictions arise in me also that your, that your other words are valid too. By the power, the power and the depth of the understanding of the emptiness, you see the wonder of the depth of the experience of emptiness, which was never taught before by any other teacher. Seeing this depth and anything what the Buddha taught, I just 
freely see that all other teachings are so efficacious and so reliable. Third one, you who speak ex excellently by seeing as it is, by seeing as it is, meaning things exist as empty of existence, empty of object existence, and you see it that way. For those who train in your footsteps, all degenerations will become remote. Degenerations meaning all degenerations of miseries, suffering, fear, will all become remote. Because if somebody follows your footstep, then the person will see the emptiness of their existence. When a person sees the emptiness of their existence, then the wisdom will grow. This wisdom will counteract the ignorance, several ignorance. Self grasp ignorance is counteracted, what happens? Then all the miseries will dissolve. So, following your footstep, all degenerations like miseries will become remote. For the root of all faults will be undone. What is the root of all faults? Self grasping ignorance. So, with this wisdom, following your footstep, wisdom will be cultivated. This wisdom will undo the root of all the faults, which is the self grasping ignorance. 32. But those who turn away from your teaching, Though they, they may struggle with hardship for a long time, falls increase ever more as they've been called for, for they make firm the view of the self. So as long as you adhere to the belief that things exist objectively, however hard you may put effort to uh, go, towards, go towards nirvana, but as long as you view, you reinforce, the, reinforce this view of the objective existence, believing that things exist objectively, then there's no freedom at all. It will, the more the self grasp ignorance is reinforced, more the afflictions will arise. More the afflictions arise, more the contaminant karmas will be accumulated. More the contaminant karmas will be accumulated, more miseries will fall on you. So this is the vicious cycle. 33. Aha, uh -huh. when the wise comprehend the difference between these two, these two meaning, the, the teaching taught by you, in the context, in the teaching by taught, taught by you, which is the emptiness in the context of dependent origination, and the teaching taught by others, which reinforces objective existence, independent existence. When you, when I see the two things, when I see the two things, aha! When the wise comprehend the difference between the, these two, why would they not at that point revere you from the depths of their being? Therefore, let alone your numerous teachings, even in the meaning of a small part, those who find ascertainment in a cursory way in a very superficial way, this brings supreme bliss to them as well. Even if they get a glimpse of emptiness, let alone getting full understanding and the import of emptiness, even a glimpse, a superficial, cursory glimpse of emptiness, this will help to cleanse our mental anxieties, fears and so forth, and gives us bliss and happiness. Terrifying. Alas, okay, now the technicalities, the, the technical parts are all done. Now it's easier. <laughs> 35. Alas, my mind was defeated by ignorance, though I've sought refuge for a long time. In such an embodiment of excellence, I possess not a fraction of his qualities. So the author, Laman Sangapa, he's saying that, Alas, my mind was defeated by ignorance, not knowing this brilliant emptiness which he taught long time ago. Though I've sought refuge for a long time in such embodiment of excellence, I possess not a fraction of his qualities, meaning of the Buddha's qualities. 36. Nonetheless, before the stream of this life flowing towards death has come to cease, that I've found slight faith in you, even this I think is fortunate. So now, what happened? The author, that from the story which we, uh, from the, the background of this text, how this text came to be, the author wrote this Opposed this text when? When you got the first crystal clear experience of emptiness at the advice of at the advice of Manjushri, the Buddha of Wisdom. So now he's saying that and now finally here today I've experienced this wisdom which you the Buddha, the compassion teacher Buddha Shakyamuni taught. 36. Nonetheless, before the stream of this life flowing towards the death has come to cease meaning that before he comes to the end of his life, that I've found a slight faith in you. Today, I've seen this wisdom of emptiness. My faith in you, I've grown, I've seen this unshakable faith, faith grounded in wisdom. Even this, I think, 
is fortunate. He's been so humble. He's been so humble, saying that, that I have found slight faith in you, meaning this a slight unshakable faith. Right? Through seeing this wisdom, the light which you taught. Even this, I think, is fortunate. 37. Among teachers, okay, this is so powerful. Among teachers, the teacher of dependent origination is the supreme. Amongst wisdom, the knowledge of dependent origination is the wisdom. You who are most excellent like the kings in the world, know this perfectly well, not others. So you, you the Buddhist Akyamani, you are the one who is the best of the teacher who taught dependent origination. You are the one who has the, the, the supreme of the wisdom, which knows, which has the knowledge of dependent origination. So you are the most excellent like the kings in the world. Okay, 38. All that you have taught proceeds by way of dependent origination. That too is done for the sake of Nirvana. And all what you have taught about this very complicated teaching on emptiness, sophisticated teaching on teaching on emptiness, dependent origination, that is taught, it is done for the sake of Nirvana. That the sentient beings will be freed from suffering. That the sentient beings will achieve Nirvana. You have no deeds that do not bring peace. So therefore, anything that you teach is simply to bring peace and happiness in the minds of the sentient beings. 39. How amazing your teaching is such that in whosoever ears it falls, they all attain peace. So, who would not be honored to uphold your teaching? 40. It overcomes all, all opposing challenges. It is free from contradictions between earlier and the latter parts. It grants fulfilling of beings to aims, to aims meaning, say, this, the mundane, mundane, mundane achievements and the super mundane achievements. Mundane achievements referring to mundane achievements referring to the power of the clairvoyance, the power of clairvoyance, and the same the the power of the capacity to to, to levitate all these the mundane what the mundane people would consider as made the what uh, praiseworthy like clairvoyance and reading others' minds and so forth. And the super mundane is like achieving the Paragati, Parasangati, Bodhi Soha. And in uh, say in the most sophisticated version, there's what is the usual body, clavite, the union, so these so the most of his topics are there. So these are considered as the supramental attainments. For this system, my joy increased ever more. 41. For its sake, you have given away again and again, for its sake, what sake? For the sake of seeing this wisdom of emptiness, for the sake of seeing this wisdom of emptiness, you, for many lifetimes, it's not just this lifetime, in many past lifetimes, you have given away again and again over countless eons, sometimes your body, and others your life, as well as your loving kin and resources of wealth and so forth. 42. So look, gaining the wisdom of emptiness is not easy. Even this enlightened being, Buddha Shakyamuni, Purushakyamani, what did he do to, to get this, to acquire this wisdom? What did he do? He has sacrificed a whole lot of things, eons for eons and eons. So, um, say, whatever we're getting just within like a few days, we are very fortunate that we met with such a great teaching of Lao Tzu Kappa, the author, and Ajahn Chandrakriti's text and so forth. So our job is what? Our job is, we can't really expect to see such a high qualitative experience of emptiness as what all the achieved, but we are seeing the blueprint of what is the emptiness like. And you have such a joy in the end, and you see that finally your own purpose of life rests on this experience. If this experience comes to you, the, the whole purpose of your life will come into being. If this not, then the, the, the so therefore the, your eagerness, your eagerness, your fondness towards this will come to you. This is so precious. Okay, 42. Seeing the qualities of this teaching, puts harm. Now this is the author. Author, he was he he become, he becomes he feels so poignant. He feels so poignant uh, pertaining to his relationship with the Purushakimani. Now seeing that this teacher, Purushakimani, he was just he was just ruminating, ruminating of the experience of what what if if I was there two thousand five hundred years ago. The author was now, now ruminating, ruminating. What if I was there 2,500 years ago, where this Prince Siddharth, 
actually put the heart under the Bodhi tree. And then he started to teach him, so what? If I'm sitting next to him, what would be his glow like? What would be his teaching like? Right? So he so poetically says, says it as follows, 42. Seeing the qualities of this teaching pulls heart from your heart pulls heart from your heart, just like what a hook does to a fish. So you simply pulled my, pulled me towards you. Sad it is not to have heard this teaching emptiness from you directly. The intensity, so this the author, author appeared in 14th century. 14th century. So what is the time gap between the Buddha Shakyamuni and the author? One thousand nine hundred. 1,900 years, 1,900 years. Okay, so this this much of time gap between the between the, the Purushakamani and the author of the text. And anyways, for your information, the author of the text, Nama Sangapa, it is um, the, that he achieved Buddhahood during what is known as the intermediate state. During what is, in Tibetan, it is known as Parto. In English, we can translate as intermediate state, meaning that, that the person dies, the person leaves his body, the person dies, then, then you take rebirth. Say if you if the person dies here and the person should take birth in India, for example. India, then the person's mind has to travel from this life, from this place to India. Right? And the, the body will be acquired in India. So in between, when you travel where the body where the mind travels, where the mind travels, who are you? That is known as the Pardo or the intermediate state. So same, um, very intelligent beings, incredibly intelligent beings like Lama Tsunaba with all the factors gathered, um, some of them achieve enlightenment through the intermediate state, intermediate state. It means that for the ordinary people, just you, you leave this body, instantly you connect to the intermediate state being. And for, for the author Lama Tsunaba, you, he left his body, instead of taking the intermediate birth, he achieved enlightenment. The next, very next moment, he achieved enlightenment. So, this is known as achieving enlightenment during the intermediate state. This is what's labeled like this. Okay, so this is what we need to keep in mind. The author achieved enlightenment during the immediately after leaving his body, then instead of taking the intermediate state, he achieved enlightenment. Okay, uh, 43. The intensity of that sorrow, which sorrow? The sorrow of not, not having heard this brilliant teaching from the Buddha Shakyamuni directly. The intensity of that sorrow does not let go of my mind, just like the mind of a mother constantly goes after her child, dear child. Okay. Here too, as I reflect on your words, I think now the, the, the author, he was feeling so nostalgic, he was feeling so connected, he was feeling so close intensely close towards the Buddha Shakyamuni who taught this brilliant teaching, then he was now just ruminating, just fantasizing. Okay, 44, 45. Here too, as I reflect, now he is fantasizing. <laughs> reflect on your words. I think, blazing with the glory of noble marks, the Buddha, he's describing Buddha. What, if I'm there 2,500 years ago with you, what should I be seeing you like? You, as blazing with the glory of noble monks, and hallowed in the net of light rays. This teacher, in a voice of pristine melody, spoke thus in such a way. This teacher, the Buddha Shakyamuni. The instant such a reflection of the sage's form, sage preferred Buddha, Buddha's form, appears in my mind, the moment it appears to my mind, it soothes me, it gives me such a pleasant feeling. Just as moonbeams heal a fever's pains, when you feel so hot, scorching, scorchingly, when you feel so scorching, scorchingly the hot in the daytime, and there's so much fever there, then in the nighttime it cools down, and the the the, the, the moonbeam, you just go there, you could feel the the soothing feeling, pleasant, cool feeling. Just as moonbeam heals a fever's pains, for a second. This excellent system, most marvelous, some individuals who are not so learned have entangled it in utter confusion, just like the, the tangled Balbaza grass. So, this system of the teaching of emptiness, most marvelous, and yet some individuals failing to, failing to fathom the depth of this teaching, 
failing to fathom the depth of this teaching, they just get trapped into the, the, the entanglement of confusion, just like the, um, the tangled balbasa grass. Balbasa grass is uh, the coconut husk. Coconut husk. How is the coconut husk like? They're so smooth, like the hair combed hair. No, they're just <laughs> like, you know, like this. It's full of confusion. <laughs> okay, 47. Seeing this situation, seeing that this brilliant teaching of the Buddha, now people get confused. Uh, seeing this situation, I strove with a multitude of efforts to follow after the learned ones, learned ones referring to his teacher, like um, Jesurendawa, 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 and others, and sought your intention again and again, and try to see what is the ultimate intention of the Buddha, what is the ultimate intention of the Buddha pertaining to their things, again and again, 48. At such times as I studied the numerous works of both our own midway and other schools, Shravaka, Pradhu, the what, the Vabashika, Sautantra, Chittamatra, and so forth, my mind became tormented evermore. So even the author, at one point, he, he himself ended up in many confusions. Tormented evermore, constantly by a network of doubts. 49. Now, with this doubt, then finally what happened? Okay, so this 49 and 15 and 51. 50, 49, 50, 51, these three. So these three now, will, in a way, the author is guiding us what text, what text should we learn if you really want to understand the ultimate import of the emptiness that's taught by the Buddhist Shakyamuni. So this is what the author is saying. The author is saying that, that he, in order to untangle, in order to untangle the, the, the doubts that he had pertaining to what is the ultimate teaching of the Buddha pertaining to emptiness, then he resorted to, resorted, resorted to the, the, the commentaries written by Aranagarjuna. Right? Aranagarjuna. Then even Aranagarjuna's writings, they are a little technical. Then as further commentary for Aranagarjuna's text, he depended on Achar Chandrakirti's text, which we studied. Right? Achar Chandrakirti's text. Okay, so 49. The night lily groves of Nagarjuna's treatises, meaning he gives such a beautiful, so beautifully. Say, um, it is a very beautiful garden, very beautiful garden. Night lily grove of Nagarjuna's treatises. Beautiful garden, metaphor for Aranagarjuna's writings, which is Mula Matimika Karika, the fundamental wisdom of the middle way. This is the, the one. So that is given the analogy of the night lily groves, the garden, very beautiful garden, and yet in dark. Beautiful garden, but in dark, right? You will not enjoy the garden. The garden is non-existent. It is not non-existent. It is there, but because of my because of my blindness, I could not see that. Because of the, the because of there's no light, I could not see that. So the night lily grow from Nagarjuna's treatises. Nagarjuna, whom you, the Buddha Shakyamuni, prophesied would unravel your unexpected vehicle as it is, shunning extremes of existence and non-existence. So this beautiful garden was illuminated by the light of Archer Chandrakirti's text. Okay, illuminated by the garden of white lights of Chandra's Chandra meaning the moon, Chandrakirti, Chandrakirti Chandra meaning the moon. So Aranagarjuna's text, the beautiful text, which remained dark, was illuminated by the commentaries of Archer Chandrakirti, Archer Chandra the moon, Chandra's well uttered insight. Chandra, whose stainless wisdom orb is full, who glides freely across a scriptural space. So, what we studied is Ajahn Chandrakirti's text. What is that? Entry into middle way. So, this is the, this is what we have to depend on in order to, in order to, in order to illuminate this beautiful garden of Aranyagarjuna's text. What is Aranyagarjuna's text? Fundamental wisdom of the middle way. Okay, fifth one. Who dispels, who dispels the darkness of extremist hearts and outshines the constellations of false speakers? Uh, outshines the constellation of false speakers, meaning at the time of Ashara Chandrakirti, after Aranigarjuna, between Aranigarjuna and Ashara Chandrakirti, there were many teachers who came to interpret Aranigarjuna's text. And Ashara Chandrakirti refuted many of them, saying that your interpretation is not correct. 
So I said, I'd love to know that the author is saying that, saying that you who outshine the constellations of the false speakers, who falsely interpreted Aranyakarjana's works. When through my teacher's kindness I saw this, my mind found a rest at last. This is what the author is saying through the kindness of his teachers, particularly teacher referring to Adam Manjushri. Particularly referring to Adam Manjushri. Through the kindness of his teacher Adam Manjushri, he I saw this, saw this meaning, this the, the beautiful garden of Aranyakarjana, which was illuminated by Acharya Chandrakirti's text of the entry in the middle way. So then the author, the author, Lama Tsongkhapa, his mind found a rest at last. All the confusion dissolves. All doubts dissolve. 52. Of all your deeds, your speech is supreme. Of all your deeds, meaning the Buddha's benevolent deeds, divine deeds of the body, speech, and mind, the speech, your speech is supreme. The speech of emptiness, speech of dependent origination. Within that too, it is this very speech, with speech, the speech of dependent origination and emptiness. So the wise should remember the Buddha through this teaching of dependent origination. If you really want to, if you if you really want to remember Buddha Shakyamuni, we should remember him through his speech. Remember his speech of dependent origination and his speech of emptiness. So it is for this reason that all the all the all the places by which Aranyakarjuna remembered the Buddha Shakyamuni was always, always on emptiness and dependent origination. Okay, if you remember the first stanza every day we, we read, what is that first stanza? What is the first stanza which we read every day? And huge by great compassion, you taught immaculate dharma. What is that immaculate dharma? The wisdom of emptiness and dependent origination. Right? To dispel all perverted views, to you the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Who said this stanza? This word of salutation to Buddha Shakyamuni by Aranyagarjuna. So all the interpraces which Aranyagarjuna made as a salutation to Buddha Shakyamuni is on the basis of Buddha Shakyamuni having taught dependent origination and emptiness. Okay. 53. Following such a such a teacher and having become renunciate, such a teacher, the Buddha Shakyamuni and Aranyagarjuna, and having become a renunciate, this um, the. Lama Tsongkhapa, following the spiritual path, relationship, having studied the conqueror's words not too poorly, having studied the conqueror's no, that so there is, in, in, this, in this book, there is one uh, uh, section. Okay, if you could say, go to the table of contents, table of contents, if you, um, Table contents. Do you see something with the title? Noble pursuit, revealing one's personal realizations. Do you see that? Huh? Table of contents on the on the second page. Noble pursuit, revealing one's personal realizations. Do you see that? Yes. What page is that on? One and four. One and four. So this is this this is the author author revealing what text he studied. Revealing what studies he went through, what trainings he went through. So it says, revealing one's personal realization. From this, you will see that how much he has, how much he studied, right? Okay, so it says that, 53, page 62, following such a teacher and having become a villain chief, having studied conqueror's words not too poorly. Not too poorly meaning he studied extensively. So he's... <laughs> In a way, in a way, in a way, he is, the author is the author is very gently encouraging us to study extensively. <laughs> this is a gentle way of encouraging us. Yeah, who said, "Have you studied the conqueror's words not too poorly?" Meaning, you also don't do it. You also, you also um, study the conqueror's words not too poorly. This is advice. Okay. And this monk who strives in the yogi yogic practices, then not only studied, he went into intense practice of the Dharma. Such is the depth of his reference to the great seer. Great seer meaning the Buddha Shakyamuni. So therefore, so this is the beauty of the teachings of the Buddha. Where, where we don't have to really have a blind faith in the Buddha Shakyamuni. We don't have we don't need someone else. 
to say, that, hey, you must go to Buddha Shakyamuni, you must make prostrations, he is the, then he will grant you cities. No, we don't do believe like that. Simply study his text, study what he taught, and you practice it, you could feel who he is. So this is amount of the depth of the reference, reverence, which cannot be shaken. 54. Since it is due to now, how come that the, the author, now the, the author is sharing with us, how come that the author is able to meet with such brilliant experience of the, and so forth? It says, since it is due to my teacher's kindness, I've met with the teaching of the unexcelled teacher. Unexcelled teacher is Aramaji Sri. And the, the first one, since it is due to my teacher's kindness, teacher referring to, say, Jesu uh, Rendawa, Jesu Rendawa, and then Aramaji Sri. There are several teachers, many more teachers there. I've met with the teaching of the unexcelled teacher. I dedicate this virtue too towards the cause for all beings to be sustained by sublime spiritual matters. This is so important, so important. So therefore, it's always very important to make sure that you, jo you don't just easily plunge into looking for teachers, looking for spiritual gurus. Don't easily jump into, decide, oh, he's my root guru, she's my root guru. Don't easily go for that. Right? So, the thing is that it says what? The author prayed that I dedicate this virtue to towards the cause for all beings to be sustained by not any other, not any spiritual teachers. He said what? By sublime spiritual mentors. So unless and until you get a confidence that the, the person who, from whom you are learning things, the person is a very sublime spiritual mentors, only then you can take a person is to teach. Otherwise, simply because the person is very popular, uh, the person is giving empowerment. Oh, this empowerment we will never get later on. <laughs> right? We're not this. Maybe the, this is the, the last empowerment that he's going to give. Right? This tuberculosis medicine. This is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last one. Right? In the, in the, in the, then the, all the factories will be shut down. <laughs> this is the last medicine. This is the last medicine for the leprosy. It's all now shut down, right? Oh, I must buy it, I must eat it. Others are oh, not getting any more. This is unwise. This is unwise. Simply because, oh, something that they teach this is not going to this is not going to happen the next 12 years. This is not the way. Be kind towards yourself, be wisely kind towards yourself. Okay. Fit to five. May the teaching, so therefore, this teaching which we are having here, this I made it very clear since long time ago. This is purely like a university lecture. This is purely like a university lecture. Your job, your job is to simply learn, to simply learn and know what is for noble truths, what is emptiness, what is bodhicitta, what is for seals, what is for immeasurables, and then on that basis, how to practice. You learn all these things. And then renunciation, wisdom of English, bodhicitta, shamatha, you learn all these things. Only after learning all these things, you gain a deep conviction, you gain some kind of little uh, inkling of some experience within you. Wow, it's amazing, bodhicitta is amazing, wisdom of is amazing. Then you think about the bodhicitta for a while, you just feel like crying, you just manage the wisdom of emptiness, then goosebumps can come on you, a tinge of fear can come on you. When these experiences come to you, then it is time for you to decide for a teacher because you are very confident. You know what you want. You know what you want. And then you can see whether someone giving a teaching, whether the person really has the, the qualities as what you are seeking. You can actually see that very easily. Right? On that basis, then you can decide it. Not simply because he's popular, she's popular, so therefore, so maybe he will not come after 10 years, for the next 10 years, he will not come after till, till 10 years. So I must grab the opportunity. This is all very unwise. But an unintentional way of looking for teachers. Teachers don't play with, you know, looking for, rashly looking for teachers. Don't play like this. This is very dangerous, right? Okay. Now, fit fine. May the teaching of this beneficent one till world's end be unshaken by the winds of evil thoughts. With teaching, the teaching on dependent origination and teaching on emptiness and the bodhicitta. May it always be met by inevitable beings who find conviction in the teacher by understanding the teachings true nature. This is exactly what's said here. May it always be met by inevitable beings who find conviction in the teacher. Who find conviction in the teacher through what? Not because of the popularity, but by understanding the teachings true nature. 
What other person is teaching emptiness? What other person is teaching bodhicitta? What is other person teaching dependent origination? And then see what other person taught and see to your experience. If you get a little flavor out of that, then you will get conviction. Through this conviction, then you will see how precise, how accurate, how reliable the teacher is. Then on that basis, you decide whether the other person to be accepted as your teacher or not. Otherwise, not simply because of other reasons. 56. May I never falter, even for an instant, to uphold the excellent of the sage, which illuminates the principle of dependent origination through all my births, even giving away my body and life. So seeing that this teaching is so precious, so precious, just you get a glimpse of this, get a glimpse of this, and you could see that physiologically you could feel such a peace in the mind. The mind feels such a serenity, acutely, profoundly serene state of mind we acquire. So, um, this teaching is so precious. And then, no doubt, it leaves no doubt, it leaves no doubt that the, it will take you to Nirvana and Buddhahood. So, because of which, it's so precious. And then his, his love and affection, the author's love and affection to his all sentient beings, he sees that this is so precious, this is the final panacea to heal the miseries of all the all sentient beings. So he doesn't want to lose this. He, do, he wants to uphold this, even at the cost of his life. He wants to uphold this and spread it to us as many dear mother sentient beings as possible. 56. May I never falter even for an instant to uphold the excellent way of the sage, sage meaning the Buddha, which illuminates the principle of dependent origination through all my births, even giving away my body and life. May I spend day and night carefully reflecting by what means can I enhance his teaching achieved by the Supreme Savior through strenuous efforts over countless eons. As I strive in this with pure intention, may, as, as I strive in this pure intention of disseminating this teaching in, in the mind of all the emergent beings, may Brahma, Indra, and the world's guardians, Brahma and Indra, they are the kings of the celestial beings on different realms. In different realms. May Brahma, Indra, and the world's guardians and protectors such as Maka unswervingly, un the, the Unshakingly, always assist me in this pursuit, in this pursuit of disseminating this brilliant teaching, this this legacy, this panacea, this panacea, the teaching of the empty empty spiritualism for all the spiritual beings. Okay. Okay. As our special son, we will quickly read the from page fifty. I will read from page fifty two, one or two stanzas. In praise of dependent origination, he who speaks on the base of seeing this makes him a noble and teacher like unexcel about you or conquer you who so dependent origination taught it. Whatever degeneration is there are in the world, the root of all this is ignorance. You taught that it is dependent origination, the same way she will undo this ignorance. Okay, good. Um, any questions? Kishila, you share with us that there is Bodhisattva in 165th of the second meditates on the emptiness. Is it different level of uh, 100, 173 to be exact you shared? Is it 173 modes of rejections or how independence being presented? Uh, sorry, emptiness being presented. What is this 173? Is it method, uh, rejections? Topics, topics. Topics. And, uh, 173 topics, many of the topics they're repeated, but with the proper sequence. It's not just randomly mixed up. They're proper sequence of 173 topics, like emptiness, impermanence, and so forth. And emptiness, for example, it repeats several times. Impermanence repeats several times, but not empty, emptiness uh, sometimes, empty, not like that. Emptiness, and there are two. There's a proper reason for these repetitions. And the same for the emptiness, uh, one, and number four is the emptiness, number 37 is the emptiness, the meditation should be just precisely like this. It shouldn't be altered randomly, right? So is there a text that compiles the yeah, 173? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, and the, the title? Yes, yes. It is the ornament of clear realization. On that note, may I humbly request that uh, in an, any auspicious occasion you come and teach us the text? <laughs> okay, so in the monastic universities, this is studied for at least, at least seven to nine, eight, eight years. Anyway, 
Anyway, it is very auspicious. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say yes. <laughs> And keep in mind that that <laughs> TBC is here, ABC is there, many centers are there, and particularly say TBC and ABC, TBC Kishila is here, and ABC also there is Kishila, right? You are very fortunate, very fortunate. I really mean it. I wholeheartedly mean it. Very fortunate. Because this just before this class, I met Kishila, and I was telling him that it is. So incredibly great courage and incredibly great kindness of yours that you are available here in Singapore. So his stature. Don't think that anyone who is among, right, in a center, right, oh, also Gishila, oh, so I'm Gishila, I'm not like this, no. <laughs> Don't think like this. Because if it will be some people, right, some people, they also want Rinpoche, you know, Rinpoche, and who is a monk? And then one time I was, I told, I shared this here. I shared this here. Anyway, I'll repeat it. it matter. <laughs> one time I was, I was going to, to Lahore, through, through that place, what is that, Rotham Pass. Rotham Pass, there is one pass, we have to cross that. So that pass, the, the road, a road, if the road is very narrow, you're very lucky. If the road is very narrow and you can't get stuck, you're very lucky. You don't have to worry. Everybody will help you to remove the car. Everybody will smile, you know, lift your car, make sure that your car moves. And don't get, stuck. don't get your car stuck in a wide road. You know? <laughs> you get your car stuck in a very narrow road. There are thousands of cars behind you. They cannot move. They cannot move. So they also want to go. So they will remove, they help you to you know, move your car. But if you get car gets stuck in a wide road, nobody will take care of you. Everyone will go like this. So unfortunately, I was totally new there. And my car got <laughs> my taxi, the taxi got stuck there with a very narrow passage. I was really I was now what happened? Oh Everybody is smiling, very calm, cool, lifting the car, everybody, very strong people, they come and they talk to you. Wow, it's so, it's a paradise. It's really a paradise. Wow, amazing, amazing. This must be Buddha Midabas. Yeah, this must be pure land. I'm so happy. Then, coming back, returning after one month, after a retreat, coming back, then, our car got stuck in a very wide road, right? Then I thought, oh, now people will be more easier. It's white. It's very white, right? It's so white. Then <laughs> all cars. Then so we started. First, we just stand stood like this, thinking that they will stop by. Nobody stopped. Then we have to stop them. Nobody stopped. And finally, one person stopped and said, "Are you Rinpoche?" Then I said, no. Then he left. <laughs> <laughs> so soon as he was being a mom, he thought that he's also a Buche, right? So therefore, being uh, someone <laughs> with a you know, a mom, don't think that, oh, that Agishi is also like that. Don't think like that. There is a stark contrast, stark contrast. To reach to the level of Kishilas is not easy. So out of, out of 10,000 monks, uh, let's say out of 1,000 monks, five, if we have such like the statue of Gishila, you are very lucky. Five out of 1,000, you are very lucky. Even that is very rare. So therefore don't, simply because he is always here, it doesn't mean that he is like any other monk. He's very well respected, highly, highly knowledgeable, qualified teacher. Right? You are very fortunate from that point of view. So therefore, why don't we take advantage of that as well, right? Okay, any other questions? Yes. Thank you for the teachings. Kishina, thank you for the precious teachings. I'm just wondering that I understand that emptiness essentially is the same. Once you realize it, um, for the different bases. So like emptiness of a chair, emptiness of a table, 
is the same. My question is, I understand there is uh, this necessity to meditate uh, emptiness, I think the 16 emptinesses. I'm just wondering, why is there a need to meditate on the 16 emptinesses if emptiness itself is the same? It's just like the five paths, right? When we realize the path of seeing, the emptiness that's realized at, on that path is the same as the emptiness that goes along it, uh, along it till Buddhahood, right? So if that being the case, right, for in terms of the five paths, is there a difference? If there's no difference, um, what is the distinctive feature that distinguish the five paths? Okay, this very good question. Very good question. Thank you. Okay, the first thing is, uh, say, the emptiness. Is there any difference between you meditating on emptiness of the flower, emptiness of the chair, emptiness of yourself, and the emptiness of the person sitting you, sitting next to you, emptiness of the the atoms? Like, is there any difference? Answer is yes, yes. In one way, yes. Is if you are more infatuated towards if you are more infatuated towards, say, the flowers, the moment you see the flowers, your mind simply, you know, what? Becomes so active. And it simply becomes, it starts to glow. And then the moment you see the book, you want to sit down. <laughs> right? So here, the, there, the need for us to see the entrance of the flower that would be much, much more effective and faster for you to go towards Gati Gati, one. Number two, you may think about emptiness of the books, the flowers and these things. These things. And, okay, you may get a feeling. You may get some understanding. Then you go to work with your mind. And particularly when you feel the pain. When you feel the pain, you think about emptiness, it will not come. Because the pain is so, so closely intertwined by the self grasp ignorance that the self grasp ignorance refuses to go. Right? So even if you, you try to say, manage your emptiness, this self grasp ignorance, because the pain is, is pain and pleasure, these are the, the feelings. The feelings they determine who we are. Right? Who we are. Say, if you are at home, and before coming to this class, before coming to this class, if you are at home and oh now it is time to go to the, the class, TBC class, and suddenly somebody says something so nasty against you, just before you come out, somebody is so so nasty, then you feel so heavy, right? And then okay, now you don't want to go to class, okay, forget about it. Because the pleasantness, the feeling is very unpleasant. This stops you from going to going to the whatever you wherever you're going, right? So the feelings decides all our actions. Feelings. And the feelings are determined by the perceptions. Perceptions determine your feelings and the feelings determine your actions. Right? So therefore the feelings play a very important role. Because the feelings play a very important role in your actions. So dismantling, seeing the emptiness of feeling is much more difficult. And particularly when you are in evident pain. Evident pain and evident excitement. Seeing the absence of that is much more difficult. Right? So therefore, this is one thing. Now the next part, which, which is very ex explicitly said, said in the, the text, is what I'd like to share with you, is the meditation, meditating on the emptiness of the external objects, meditating on the emptiness of the mind. Medical entries of mind is much, much, much more powerful. So therefore, when as you as you go into the paths, you are encouraged to meditate on the emptiness of mind. That's very powerful. And meditating on the, I think Buddha nature. There are how many kinds? There are two kinds. What are the two kinds of Buddha nature? Proliferating Buddha nature and a natural Buddha nature. What is the natural Buddha nature? Emptiness nature of our mind. Right? So by meditating on the national Buddha nature, national Buddha nature, the emptiness of the nature of your own mind, then the cleansing of your mind happens much faster. Right? 
At the same time, manual entrance of the mind is quite scary as well. Quite scary. So if you do that, and if, if, it, if it gets such a fear, you must consult a teacher. Right? Fear, particularly unbearable fear. A, a tinge of fear is fine. A tinge of fear is good. A tinge of fear will eventually be transformed into acute peace, eventually. But the unbearable fear don't, don't, retain, don't remain in that state. You must consult a good teacher. Okay. So, then in what way the five paths, this question, five paths are distinguished. Five paths are distinguished more um, in line with the intensity of the wisdom of emptiness and intensive, same with the bodhisattva path, intensity of the wisdom of emptiness and the intensity of the bodhicitta. Right? And then, say, the path of accumulation, what is the, the mark of having upgraded to the path of uh, the preparation within the path of accumulation? Again, there are three from the small to the middle to the great. So what makes you, what are the criteria that, that you are entitled to be moved from the small to the great, the middle to the great, great to the, the part of preparation, within part of preparation, he, big, all these are there. So they are the very, very clear cut definitions and borders I explained in on the ornament of clear light. So that we have to study. Yeah. So, um, so TB is there, TB is there, AB is there, and there must be others also, I have no clue, but uh, two of them are there. We are all very fortunate that you know, these two centers are there with the teaching, teaching there, and very qualified teachers there. And particularly, I know Kishila so well from many years, and uh, I have no clue of the Kishila there in ABC, but I, I do know. I do come to know uh, from many that that you know the Kishila is a wonderful, wonderful teacher in ABC. I really rejoice and congratulate him for doing such a good thing. And Kishila, I know him so well for a number of years, and he's an amazing, incredibly great, highly qualified teacher. You are very fortunate. Okay. Anyone? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, anyone? Anyone? I should ask both questions. Uh, it's always baffling to me that uh, Rama Chongkapa is uh, considered the, one of the great proponents of Prasangika, Madhyamika. And as in uh, stanza 50, also he uh, acknowledged that he's following the lineage of uh, Chandra Kirti. But on the other hand, Chandra Kirti also offered his critique of the Swatantra of uh, Bhavya, Baba Viveka. Uh, because of the use of uh, pramana, so in what way? On the other hand, Lama Chongkapa also used pramana bada, and that's the why uh, Taksang Losawa also offered his critique of Lama Chongkapa approach. So in what way do you think that uh, Lama Chongkapa use of pramana itself is not foundationalist? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, this is journal's PhD program. <laughs> 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 You know that? You don't know that? So I'm revealing the secret. <laughs> because this is a very complicated matter, and he's bringing this up. Okay, so basically the idea, to make it very simple, it is like saying, say me, or anyone. Anyone, anyone, any, everyone has good qualities and weaknesses. Everyone has good qualities and weaknesses, right? So your job is to pick up all the good qualities. So, Ashwar Chandrakriti, his unique quality is establishing the ultimate reality. And Pramana Vardhika, the unique quality is not to establish ultimate reality. Unique quality is to, is to establish, to, is, to, uh, is to establish the workings of the lo no logic. Establish the workings of the logic, Pramana Vardhika, workings of the logic, and also the concept of the rebirth and also karma and these things, but not, not emphatically to establish the ultimate reality. This is not the, the main the task, the main specialization. So specialization is very different. So Lama Tsunkhapa, he, he proclaimed to follow Acharya Chandrakirti on the basis of Acharya Chandrakirti's exposition of the ultimate reality. 
and then he, Lama Sangha performed the Pramana Vartika, not for Pramana Vartika's exposition of the ultimate reality, but the Pramana Vartika's exposition of the logic and the rebirth concept and the law of karma and the establishing what what does it mean by enlightenment, right? So the specialization is different, and Lama Tsongkhapa is picking up those specializations of the various texts. And in fact, what I usually say is that um, Brahmana Vartika, Brahmana Vartika, particularly Brahmana Vartika chapter 2, is an amazing text, amazing text. It has, it has two sides. It has two sides. One is the, the, the main structure. It is the main, the whole structure, the, the what do you call it, the Hindu. The mainstream Buddhism, the mainstream full flesh blueprint of the Buddhism is explicated there in this text, Pramana Vartika chapter 2. This is one thing. Then, number two is it also talked a little bit about the Atman reality. Number two. Atman reality that is explained is not in detail. Number two. So, what I say is that, um, like container. Container and the content. Container and the content. The main body of the main body of the Buddha's teachings, main body of the Buddhism, is the container, and the content is the Atman reality. What constitutes the Atman reality? Why you have to practice like this, 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 this? So all the structures given. What should I practice? That is the wisdom of emptiness. So that is the content. Now, all the others are the container. So. Abhidhamma, the Pramana Vartika chapter 2, Pramana Vartika chapter 2, what I say is that it has the container and content. Container wise, it's a brilliant container, it's a diamond container. Use this diamond container and the content, use the diamond content from Aranigarjuna, put it there. <laughs> right? And this will benefit you the greatest, in the greatest way. Right? So, this is exactly what Lama Tsongkhapa did. Okay. So, this question is asked by Chua Li Hui. The question is, Swatantrik analyzed the table to the extent of table tops and, and legs, etc. and said that there is, um, said there is objective existence, exactly as this one is true. Uh, why stop there? If it is not tangible, does it mean Swatantrika also accept no objective existence? Since, not, since nothing you can hold on to. Sorry, um, is Chuali Hui here? You want to ask personally? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mike. I don't understand why for Swatantrika school, when they accept objective existence, you give the example of the table, and then it's, it's the analysis stop at the tabletop and the legs. So I said the shape of the table oh. is the table. Yeah. Why Part does it two? stop there? Huh? Why do they stop it? Because they don't find. <laughs> they don't find. They don't find the table beyond that point. So they stop there. Then they didn't accept. Hey, where is the way? Right? Uh. Then I go to I go to for the in India. In Canada, um, and finally in Singapore, right? Hey, we live in TBC, then somebody comes to your father, mother comes to TBC, and then come see you, right? That's finished, stop there. Don't check who oh, leave his body, is Levi, Louis' mind is Levi. The moment you go there, you will not find Levi, right? So it's stop there because beyond that point, it's not findable. Exactly, you accept as it is. Good. Give me the mic. Anyone else? There's two more questions over here. Okay. Um, question number one. Does Buddha accumulate any uncontaminated karma? Yes, yes. Every time, every time you have the experience of non-dual emptiness, simultaneously you are accumulating uncontaminated karmas. The question is, does Buddha accumulate any uncontaminated karma? My answer is yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
next question is, in what way reciting Heart Sutra can help to pacify obstacles of oneself or others? So basically, okay, this is a good question. This is a good question. In what way, okay, anyone who encourages you to recite mantra, do this puja, do this puja, ask this question to these people, right? I don't encourage such things as much. And you ask me the question, I'll give the answer. Okay, say, um, Heart Sutra. Heart Sutra, the quantum matter which is, the quantum matter which is emptiness, wisdom of emptiness, wisdom of emptiness. And then the, unlike the ordinary people, the same Heart Sutra mantra, Heart Sutra, was recited by many great saints who have, who have direct realization of emptiness and who have, at least, Realization of emptiness. They said it. As they, as, they said, as they said this Heart Sutra with realization of emptiness, right? Then what we inherit, what we inherit, for example, we see that we have His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama reciting the say the Heart Sutra and so forth. So there, His Holiness the Dalai Lama with his very clear understanding of the emptiness, he recites it, and then we are we are reciting alone with him, and we are receiving. What we are reciting is like the lineage that we are getting from His Holiness and His great teachers. So from this, what happens is that it is like unintentionally you are taking the you are suffering from tuberculosis, and without knowing how this medicine helps you, you are taking the asunazent, rifampicin, itambudo, these many medicines. <laughs> what what are the medicines? These medicines, without knowing what these medicines are, you take it and your problems will be healed. Without knowing what these are. Because you got the right medicine. Likewise, Heart Sutra is the right medicine which was being which was being experimented and experienced, and it also has what is known as the, the blessings. Blessings in the form of those earlier saints who recited this. They recited with the effect being felt, effect being felt. And this part, usually I don't emphasize as much in the public teachings. Usually I don't emphasize on this part because people can easily fall into blind faith. And yet, there is this effect there, but I don't want to stay in this, say, share this in this, um, because emphasis should be on the wisdom and emptiness and not on this element of you know, vibration and these things. I don't want to go in this line. Although there is the effect. The moment I say this, then you may tilt more towards that and you may forget about emptiness. Finally, what happens, what helps, is the wisdom of emptiness of Bodhicitta. And these things, they are like, you know, supporters. One last question from the SMS. Um, Geshe-la, uh, the non-arising from another is reputing the arising phenomena objectively. But does it also refute the cause and effect? In bracket? there is effect without cause. So in fact, I'm rejecting the production of another. So in fact, this is not really easy thing. We cannot really decide everything in just four, five, uh, six days, right? And yet, and this is the, this is a very important topic. Somehow we have to tackle, um, the, tackle with that. Okay. So when we reject the, uh, say, production from another, so if you if you could remember, if you could remember um, how Acharya Chandrabhi rejected the style of his rejection, rejecting logically and rejecting, rejecting uh, by uh, rejecting by citing the acceptance of the by 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 showing contradiction with the conventional acceptance, so in two ways. So there, uh, when you speak about, <clears throat> say, there's no product, there's no production from, there's no production from another, right? There's no production from another. It is not saying that there's no production. Production is accepted. So always with these four, first we have to, uh, we need to keep in mind two questions. First question, whether or not there's production, Question 
Number two, if the answer is yes, only then we can go to second. Yes, the production state. Then the question is whether or not there's a true production. Number two. Then if you say no, there's no true production, then you can go to the third one, whether or not there's an objective production. Right? Okay. So to come to these two, the second and the third. The second and the third, it is it is taken for granted that you accept the production. When the production is accepted, then results being produced by a cause is already accepted. So this cannot possibly reject the law of karma. Because law of karma means the law of karma is a cause giving rise to the result. Law of karma is a cause producing a result. Right? So this is um, not at all the case. Only um, the production from the self, production from another, production from both self and another, and constant production, these were rejected. Last one. Yes, Kesila. So in the in the all emptiness we are talking about, uh, I just classified three emptiness. That's a very important one: external emptiness, internal emptiness, obsolete emptiness. Uh, emptiness. Uh -huh. So is there any more emptiness? We did five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> say more than sixteen. Okay, 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 okay. In fact, yes, 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 yes. So. So in this, um, okay, if we turn to page twenty eight of this book. Page 28 or 27, there could be um, a subject variation here. There is a topic, divisions of emptiness. No, everything is discussed here. Divisions of emptiness. So there, um, 16 emptinesses are described, and then 18 emptinesses are described, 4 emptinesses are described, 2 emptinesses are described. Yes. Yes, so this is on page 28. Uh, chapter 6, stanza 179. Yeah. Okay. You do it. You do it. 